Today's webinar is entitled Engineering Leadership, an Overview of Programs at RIT. Our presenter today is Mark Smith, Director of Multidisciplinary Programs in RIT's Kate Gleason College of Engineering. In his role at RIT, Mark is responsible for graduate programs in product development and manufacturing leadership, as well as certificates and other customized course offerings for corporate clients. He is also serving as director of the John D. Romey Center for Quality and Applied Statistics. Prior to joining RIT, Mr. Smith spent nearly 20 years in medical electronics R&D in both technical and management roles. He has a BS in engineering science from the University of Virginia and an MS in electrical engineering from the University of Rochester. Mark, let's get started. Thank you very much, Cindy. Uh, and if anybody has questions, I encourage you to submit them as we're going along so that we don't lose our train of thought, but you're certainly also welcome to wait until the very end. As Cindy mentioned, we're going to be talking for a few minutes, about 30 minutes or so, to provide plenty of time for questions about some unique leadership programs at RIT that are housed in the Kate Gleason College of Engineering, but are in partnership with the Saunders College of Business. And those programs are specifically the Master of Science in Product Development, which is a blend of business management and systems engineering management for engineers and folks in R&D and advanced manufacturing. Then the manufacturing leadership, Masters of, Master of Science, which is focused on process excellence with a very broad applicability. In fact, we have a number of students who don't work in corporate America, but instead are working in nonprofits. Those are the two full Master of Science degrees, which I'll go over in some detail. And then last but not least, we have several certificate programs, which are relatively short three-course programs in systems engineering, supply chain management, and project management. But others certainly can be crafted, particularly with corporate sponsorship. All of these programs share some of the following common attributes. They emphasize leadership and decision-making. They have engineering and business content with a strong systems orientation. They're all for experienced practitioners, and they're available entirely online. Although, if you're in the area, you can take about half the courses in most programs uh, in class here in the evenings. So if you're looking for something else, then please contact uh, Cindy or leave a message at the end of this webinar and we'll refer you to the proper, um, we'll refer you elsewhere. So Master of Science in Product Development. This is an outgrowth of, of an organization called the Center for Innovation and Product Development at MIT which consisted of a group of companies and universities focused on U.S. competitiveness by strengthening capabilities and leadership in product and services innovation. So the point of that is that the program really was created from the ground up to focus on product development, product innovation as the program theme and the highest business priorities. Not a general business management or a technical program, but instead as a hybrid. As I said earlier, it's a leadership program targeting primarily engineers, but also scientists technical managers, and we actually have some that are non-technical coming from areas such as product management and related fields. The core of the program is systems engineering or systems engineering management, all about managing complexity. So it's really a more of a strategic level systems engineering around decision making as opposed to a more practitioner, technically oriented systems engineering program. We have two electives and a capstone project, which allow significant opportunities to tailor the program to both personal and business needs. It was started in 1999. We have roughly 200 graduates and currently 65 students are enrolled from roughly 35 companies. It is a 36 credit program or 12 courses. And as I said earlier, it's available fully online with roughly half the courses available in the evenings on campus if you so choose. It requires two years of experience at least. Our average is closer to 12. Um, but we're willing to accept younger students who are obviously up-and-comers uh, and are supported strongly by their organizations. A 3.0 GPA is pretty traditional for master's degree programs. We certainly prefer a technical degree engineering, but it's not essential. We deal on a case-by-case -case basis with exceptions. But the good news is there's no entrance exam required. We haven't found a strong correlation between performance on those exams and performance in the program. Here's a brief overview of the curriculum. As I said earlier, this is again about leadership and decision making. So all of these courses have that sort of shared theme and focus. Our core, the core courses in the program are the first three bullet points, which consist really of four courses. 
the excellence in product development is about not only personal and organizational leadership, but it's about leading product development teams, dealing with things like R&D management, and it also has a strong um, component around lean product development. But these core program or these core courses are about leadership systems and process. And we have a project management course, which is pretty traditional. It has half of it roughly focusing on the project management body of knowledge and the other half around people and process management. And then the real core of the program, is, as I said earlier, is engineering of systems. We have two courses, one and two. And this, again, is about managing and reducing complexity, dealing with looking at things as systems that have multiple components that all work together to develop uh, what I call emergent properties, things that only the system can, can um, can perform at, but yet you're dealing with all of the individual subsystems at the same time. But it deals with looking at product and process and supply chain design sort of as an integrated whole, and we have a really a strong emphasis here around lean product development. Um, those are the core courses in the program, so that really is where the emphasis lies. But then we have a series of courses which I call enablers, and they provide some of the supporting skills. So on this first slide, decision and risk benefit analysis, is it has, includes both probabilistic and non-probabilistic methods for decision making. It certainly supports both the engineering of systems courses as well as the project management course, because as probably all of you know, project management does include a certain amount of content around risk management and decision making. So another supporting course, another enabler is operations and supply chain management. Every, every individual that's involved in product or services development needs to understand the overall supply chain, the value chain, and this is a course that really deals with this in some detail. And then since we keep track of everything via money and numbers, we have to have a course in accounting. Um, and so you can see there what some of the elements are, as well as a course in marketing. Uh, it's a basic course in marketing concepts and commercialization. It deals with the five Ps as well as both inbound and outbound marketing. So that's really the core of the program. But last and certainly not least is our capstone project. This is an, an entire year project. Uh, it's two semesters long. You get two course credit or six, or six credits. So it involves a business problem. There's, there's two main components, both a business um, relevant issue or challenge. This is where the return on investment comes from. But there's also got to be a, a scholarly component to it. So you have both an industry advisor and a faculty advisor to represent those two perspectives. But this is really where you're able to give back to the organization um, and do something that's really important to you, where you integrate the material that you learned within the program and apply it to something that's important to you and your organization. And then we also have two electives in the program. So this gives you an opportunity for either more breadth or depth. I've provided just a very, very few examples here on this slide, but we have many, many more, and we're happy to provide you with a suggested list of electives, or you're welcome to browse our course catalog for yourself, and we can provide um, links to that. Here are some examples of capstone projects, but uh, we have many more, and you can find them um, at www.mpd.rit.edu, which we're happy to forward to you for those that want to browse. Um, the focus on the MPD capstone projects tends to be around process and value creation, as opposed to solving a particular problem at a particular organization. So we'd like to have team-based projects, but it's a little more difficult when we have students that are remote and located uh, or isolated in different companies. But when we do have teams, it's possible for team members from different companies to work together because many of the problems that you share in a product development or product innovation environment are common. It's just that the particular manifestation of them may be different depending on the organization that you happen to be in. Um, I've got a couple of slides here that I call targeted competencies. I'm not going to read through them. You can look at them. I'll leave them up for just a couple of seconds. I don't think there should be anything unexpected here. I can tell you which courses the particular competencies align with if you're interested. So please submit a question if you'd like me to go into in more detail. But again, I don't think there'll be too many surprises, marketing, you know, innovative mindset, leadership, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let me go to the next slide so you can look at the last three that we've determined. But again, these things really guide all of the courses within the program. So, you know, we sort of testing, the measurement, the curriculum, all of that stuff tries to be aligned to these core competencies. No questions? Okay. 
Um, this is a laundry list of the sponsors that have sent students. I think I mentioned it's roughly 35 or so. Uh, it clearly changes every year, uh, more or less. We've had some companies that have sent quite a few students, like Xerox, for example, uh, is the best example. Harris, we actually teach the program on site at Harris as well as at Xerox uh, and at Orthoclinical Diagnostics, as well as having the online students here. But, um, you know, as your company as you become a student here and decide to do that, then you'll be one of the sponsoring companies as well. Okay. Ah, good. I don't see the question. Okay. I have a PMP. Can I opt out or receive credit for the project management courses? There is no option to provide, to provide course credit for an industry-based certification. If you have a graduate course in that area, then we could do that. There is an option for getting credit by experience. And in that case, you have to take an exam that's delivered by the organization that delivers the course here at RIT, and then you may be given credit for that. There is one option that I do have, though, and that is that I can, if you really have a strong background, and it wouldn't have to be just PMP certification, I'd have to see what other kind of background you had, how long you've been doing project management, that sort of thing. I could give you a substitute course, so rather than repeating all the stuff that you've already done, I would give you another course that would allow you essentially to have another elective in the program. Okay, that's it for the, that's the overview of the product development program. I'm, again, I'm trying to keep this relatively high level, short and sweet. Um, any other questions, please submit them, or I'm going to move on to the um, man manufacturing Leadership Program. You know, if, if somebody wants to know more about, say, the benefits to the program, what our alumni are saying, those kinds of things, I'm happy to provide those as well. Okay, so here's our Manufacturing Leadership Program. This was developed jointly by our Colleges of Engineering and Business back in the early 90s. And so again, similar to the MPD program, it was built from the ground up. It was not based on something that existed and was sort of modified to fit what we thought our student population looked like. We built it with some express goals to create an opportunity for students that from a, are from a broad range of backgrounds get a very focused and crisp education around manufacturing, operations, supply chain, process engineering. Um, so it's, it's got the minimum number of credits we're allowed in the state for a master's degree, which is 30 or 10 courses. So it's about as short a program as you can get and still get a master's degree. Obviously, I'll talk about certificates later and we can talk about fewer way, or shorter ways in which to, to get some kind of certification from, from RIT. Um, it, it also has a capstone project. It's not six credits, it's only three credits, but these projects are very strongly focused on a particular problem at a particular company. So we see an average return on investment of about $300,000 per project over the course of the life of this program. Um, but certainly it depends on the specific project that students uh, tackle. It was started a little bit earlier than MPD at in 1996. We have over 200 graduates. Currently 45 students are here online or in class and roughly 50 or so companies. But in this case, most of the companies tend to be small to medium-sized manufacturers. I don't know exactly why that is, um, except that a lot of companies are looking at um, at having sort of su uh, succession plans in for a number of their employees, and they look at this program as being a good way to prepare folks to take those leadership roles. Uh, as I said, it's also online again, uh, fully online, asynchronous, but there are opportunities to take on-campus courses for roughly half the program. The same kind of admission requirements, two years of experience, and um, uh, 3.0 GPA with no entrance exams. And, as I said earlier, even for the MPD program, although we do have mainly engineers there, we have not many non-engineers that take the uh, manufacturing leadership degree program. Here's a quick overview of the curriculum again. Um, we have our leadership course, we have a supply chain course, manufacturing systems, I'm not going to read the detail, uh, a global facilities planning. So all of these are trying to address various elements of a sort of global operations, global process improvement leader um, at, at companies in particular. But as I said at the very beginning, this is one program where the notion of developing competence and process excellence applies well beyond sort of corporate America. So those are the first four courses required. We also have the Engineering of Systems one course. The Systems two course is a little bit more germane to the product development program. 
Um, but we think it's very important for folks in operations and manufacturing to have a strong end-to-end -end process course, which is, which is where the Engineering of Systems 1 fits in. We have a Lean Six Sigma Fundamentals course where we grant all participants with a B or better a yellow belt, and it makes you green belt ready, so if you decide you want to get a Lean Six Sigma green belt, you just need a project, which, by the way, you may actually be able to use your capstone project to satisfy. So this is a nice way to also get a green belt in Lean Six Sigma. Uh, we have the Systems and Project Management course, again, which I already went, uh, described in the MPD program. Accounting, same thing. And then, as I mentioned just a minute ago, the Capstone project is usually a client-based, deals with a client-based problem. Very strong lean orientation, often in terms of, you know, improving flow or reducing waste, the, the sort of the common um, goals of doing any kind of lean project in, within your organizations. Uh, and there's one elective in this program that's a compromise to get the program down to 30 credits. But uh, again, there are many, many choices, and uh, there are probably too many to even go over here. <clears throat> Here's an example of some of the capstone projects, and as you can probably see, the word lean shows up quite often, flow shows up quite often. But again, almost all of these would have a company attached to them because they were implemented at a particular firm. Here again is a list of targeted competencies which guide the curriculum and the learning objectives for the program and for all of the courses that are in, within the program. I don't think, again, you should see too much that's a surprise here, but they do focus just as in the MPD program around leadership and decision making. So we have the ability to make sound business decisions. We have this notion of global production and operations. We have uh, the importance of understanding quality and continuous improvement which is not just our Lean Six Sigma course, but finds its way into other courses as well. Certainly a global supply chain management emphasis is absolutely critical. And this is also a course, that, the course we have, we have several courses that dabble here, but we really recommend that our, um, you know, our MPD students, in addition to the operations supply chain course, may think about taking an elective in the supply chain area. And then last but hardly least, the strong leadership and management skills. If you have any other questions about those, please post them. Here again is a list of sponsors that have, or companies that have spent or have sent students to the program over the years. I mentioned earlier there are more small to medium sized companies within this list. Yours may be here, may not. So that concludes the overview of both the MPD and the MMNL program. I now wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about professional certificates. These are all at the graduate level. Uh, I gave you the names before, systems engineering, supply chain management, project management. They either represent, you know, a, a program onto themselves, so you get a certificate accomplishment after completing the three courses with a B or better cumulative GPA, or some students use this as a way of testing the water. They want to try a course. They've been out of school for a while. You know, I want to get in, but I, I want to get some kind of credential but without just taking one course and, and getting that on my transcript. So they'll take three courses, get the certificate they can put on their walls, display to peers and, um, and their uh, senior managers. Um, but they can certainly use that uh, to go on further to one of the master's degrees or other master's degrees here at RIT um, because it's, again, fully transferable, fully accredited. There's no issues with that. The, uh, the courses are available online, or if we do it for a particular organization, they can be done on-site or blended for larger groups. Uh, I already described the courses, and I'll go through the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the certificates, but I'll go through the names of the courses here on the next slide. We have the same admission criteria as we do for the master's programs because we don't want somebody who completed a certificate program to be turned down for admission to the master's degree. So just be aware of that if you decide you want to apply. So this is a way, this is an approach um, to completing the master's degrees somewhat incrementally. So what I've described on the list are the certificate programs in systems engineering, project management, and supply chain. If you do those three certificates, you'll have nine more credits, which consist of the capstone project, that's six credits, and an elective, and when you're done, you have the master's in product development. Similarly, you can, you can do the master's in manufacturing leadership by taking not the entire systems engineering certificate, because only engineering of systems one is required for MMNL, so that would be one course, 
plus the project management and supply chain certificates, and then nine more credits, which consist of the capstone, the Lean Six Sigma fundamentals, and an elective, and then you have the Master of Science in Manufacturing Leadership. So this is just another way to sort of skin the cat, so to speak. Here is a list of the, the courses that are in those certificates. As you can see, we're somewhat flexible because we want to be. We want to make sure that the certificate meets your needs. And since all of the courses are accredited, um, there's really no problem. But be aware that the only thing that does not happen is that the name of the certificate does not show up on your transcript. But generally at the graduate level, I've, I've never run into anybody who really cares if they have a certificate name on their transcript. It's not as if you're an undergraduate getting ready you know, to get a job and they want to see what, um, you know, what degrees you have. This is about you know, making sure that you have a competency in these areas and you do that by displaying the certificate on the wall. So this is a list of courses within those programs. Again, post, post questions, please. Uh, just a few comments about the online format because we always get questions about, well, gee, you know, I'm not sure I haven't done much online stuff before. How does it work? Um, am I going to be happy? Am I not going to be happy? I think, first of all, RIT has been doing online stuff for well over 30 years. We have many degree programs that are available. We have something called the Innovative Learning Institute where we have a bunch of experts that keep up with the state of the art and they roll that material out to faculty who are teaching. So we always try to keep our online pedagogy as current and as effective as we possibly can. Historically, our programs in the MMNL and MPD areas were, were web-based for a number of years, web conference, just like this uh, webinar is. But we made the transition in 2013-14 to a fully asynchronous online format, and we think that pays dividends because it doesn't really matter where you are or when you happen to be in a place, you can still uh, access the course materials and complete the course requirements. But one of the main reasons we made that is because more than 50% of our students in both programs now are outside of Western New York, so it's almost impossible for them to come here to RIT to take classes. Um, it's also as good as or better um, than on campus. Uh, the emphasis is different. You don't sit and listen to a lecture for very long. There tends to be much more interaction, much more kind of email sort of chat and, uh, and chat um, you know, cues that, that go on over a period of time. Um, but it's, um, so it's different, you know, some people certainly prefer in class, some people actually prefer online, but I just wanted to say a couple of things about the online format since we're usually asked. And last but hardly least is uh, some comments around logistics. RIT is not cheap, as all of you know, since you're almost all alumni, right, Cindy? Okay. So, um, so you can see that our current tuition rate as of, I shouldn't say current, as of this coming fall, is 1,673 a credit hour, um, which is interestingly enough, the, the costs for the programs as we made the transition two years ago from quarters to semesters is actually 3% lower than it was in quarters. So we tried to do a little bit to reduce costs. But you can see that a course is about 5,000 bucks, the MMNL program is roughly 50,000, and the MPD program is roughly 60,000. There are corporate discounts. Um, and we can certainly work out a plan by which you can pay over a longer period of time, but we have a financial aid department here as well, which can find other sources of aid for you. Um, most of our students certainly do get corporate support for at least a part of the tuition that they pay for these programs, or else it would be very difficult to afford them. From a workload standpoint, uh, the typical workload is roughly seven to 10 hours a week. I've broken it down here into, you know, going through the course material online. We also try to have, most of our courses have an optional one hour real time office hour during the week. This is something students have in general liked because it allows them to have some real time interaction with faculty and other students at least once a week. And homework then is roughly four to seven hours a week. So think seven to 10 hours per week um, for the, ba the, the bandwidth that's required for you to be able to take uh, an individual course. A normal load for a student is one to two courses per semester. Three is really impossible. You'd need to be a full-time student here. Um, we do have some full-time students in the program, but they are on campus. Uh, the calendar is, uh, as we move to semesters, you can see just uh, generally the fall starts in late August and ends uh, just before the holidays in December. Spring is from late January through late May, and summer is compressed to 10 weeks. You still get three credit courses, but it's compressed to 10 weeks in June through mid-August. 
And then one last slide on the contacts. You already know who I am. Lou Fantosi is here as well. He's our business development manager. He's the guy that usually works with individual students as they're getting their as they're asking questions about the program and as they're getting their application materials in place. And then we have a program coordinator who, once you're here, deals with you on a very regular basis about which courses you're taking, are you registered, all of the logistics uh, and all the minutia that will drive you crazy if you didn't have somebody who you were actually working with. So contact me, Lou, or Chris about any of this stuff, program information, course overview, and we're more than happy to help you. Thank you very much for your time, and if there are any questions, please post them and we'll tackle them one by one. Thank you, Mark. Again, as Mark just said, please type your questions into the chat box so that Mark can address them. Mark, you talked about um, a GPA of, of 3.0 or better. So what if I've been out of school for a while, uh, my GPA was not a 3.0 or better, but I've got work experience. Is this program for me? Yes, it can be. We, we often allow students to enter the program in what they call on probation. That means you have three courses in which you, the first three courses you have to maintain a 3.0 GPA or better in order to continue in the program. And at the graduate level, to be honest with you, B's and A's are the, are the standard, are the rule of thumb. You sort of have to not work very hard in order to get, to get a C. So that's the way in which we accept students that we think fit the program well, but may have been distracted when they were an undergraduate student. I think we can all relate to what was going on in our lives then. So we certainly don't want to exclude somebody who's demonstrated that they're very strong in a, in a business setting, um, which is clearly what these programs are targeted, are, are who they're targeted at. So we want to give the, those folks a break. So we can allow you on probation. If you're, if you're in the 2.4, 2.5 range, it's going to be very hard to admit you. So we're really talking about folks that are getting closer to the 2.8 range and higher for probation. Great, thank you. What about um, someone with a lot of work experience or prior training or other coursework, maybe they didn't complete a, a degree. Right. Is there credit available for any of that? Well, we always accept transfer credits up to 20% of the program, six credits for MP mm &L and seven credits for the MPD program. You can transfer those in, but again, those courses have to be at a comparable level. They have to be graduate level and they have to have been taken within the last five years. I think I mentioned earlier there is a opportunity for credit by experience, which requires an exam issued by the department. Um, not too many students take us up on that. And frankly, lots of students, it's an opportunity to get a refresher on some of the material that you may have been away from for quite some time. So yes, there are options, but they're not terribly often um, taken. So I mean, we've had not, we have several students right now that are applying with MBA, and I'm able to give them two, either six or seven transfer credits and then I can also substitute course. I think I made that comment earlier about the project management certification. If you've got a lot of experience in an area, the last thing I want you to do is spend a bunch of time sitting here going over material that you've already, you know, that you already know you've been practicing for a number of years. So we'll give you a substitute course for that. Good. Thank you. Good information. Um, and then additionally, as you said it yourself, the, the price tag is not right. inconsequential. So. <laughs> Um, I know RIT is pretty good about finding alternative uh, sources for financial aid and scholarships or other things. So can you speak to that piece of it beyond the corporate discount? Well, we almost all, RIT almost always gives some kind of financial aid to all students. Oftentimes it's in the form of loans, which may not be what you're after, but at least again it allows you to spread out payment over a number of years. And as, as most of you know, I, I think a lot of you are probably parents. The price tag for a master's degree is quite a bit lower than a price tag for a, an undergraduate degree. But our programs are priced very competitively with those that we think are very compar comparable to them. And there aren't that many of them. Again, I started off by saying these are unique graduate programs, and in fact they are. So if you do some benchmarking, I suspect you won't find a lot of programs that have really the same content, and certainly not the same names, although name, not, the name is not really what's important, but it's the content. So there are, and you know, there are, as I said, corporate discounts available. So if you can, you know, recruit several other students from your organization and enter, we're happy to provide, you know, up to 20% discount, which is helpful. But I think I said this during the, the logistics slide that it's very difficult to support this program and many others um, at this level without some kind of tuition assistance from your your employer. It's very difficult. 
Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, to the participants out there, if you have any further questions, please type them into the chat box. We can wait a couple moments to see if you have any. In the interim, um, you can see the contact information on the screen. If you have a, a more personal question that, that you don't want to kind of put out there for, for all, um, any of these folks would be happy to address them if you want to email or, or give them a phone call. You can also email any questions to RIT alum at rit.edu, and you could also tweet them if you want to be more public. And that is the at RIT underscore alumni with the hashtag me RIT webinars. Any questions we get via Twitter or via our RIT alum email account, we will follow to Mark and or Lou immediately so that they can respond to you quickly. If there are no additional questions, um, then we will conclude today's event. I would like to thank Mark for, oh, is there one coming in? I got the signal. There's a question coming in. There are some courses, thanks for the question. I'm assuming, can everybody see the question? No, they cannot. Ah, okay, I'm sorry, I'll read it. Are the courses offered exclusively during particular semesters. This was something I ran into with my undergraduate degree, where if you missed something you had, or had to retake it, you had to wait another year. I've never had a situation where I haven't been able to find a course that the student needs to take in a particular term so they could finish on time. What that means is that, you know, there are a number of courses that are available every semester, which including summer, but there are certainly some that are available only one semester or the other. So what I do when you enter the program is I prepare a course plan for you, which looks out for the duration of the program based on, you know, how, what your bandwidth is. Do you want to take one course a term? Can I, do you think I can take two courses? Can I take courses during the summer? I'll lay that out for you, but I recognize, or we all recognize that that will change. So it's really just a snapshot. And then we give you plenty of notice to indicate what courses are offered um, to, in the next term, and so we'll work with you to make sure that you find something. So it's a little bit of a complicated answer. Some courses are only available one term, some courses are available all the time, and we try to structure your course plan so you don't, don't run into a trouble, into any trouble when a course may not be offered. I hope that helps. Thank you. Additional questions? Ah, I'm sorry. Is this essential? <laughs> that's a good question. Is this essentially the same presentation at a future lunch and learn at Welsh Allen? I hope so. <laughs> and Lou is right here. Lou is the lunch and he'll be he'll be coming there. When is the Welsh Allen? Uh, it's in uh, early June. I early think. June. Yeah, okay. Right. So yeah. So yes, it, it it really is. It's very similar. But I would encourage you, even if you don't want to participate. It, actually, there's free food at the lunch and learn, so you might want to come for lunch. Um, but certainly Lou can answer any other detailed questions that you might have or, um, or anything else if you need a referral somewhere else. Yeah, so I let me just add to that. Um, I will get into time commitment and how to spread the costs. Typically all our, well, all our students are balancing work, uh, personal life, and academia. And that really gets down to time commitment and it gets down to spending dollars. So even if your company like Welsh Allen does very, very well in terms of um, helping you with tuition assistance, they have to budget. So the students have to decide on two years, a three-year program, a four-year, or five or so. You have a seven-year limit. Um, and what that does is spread the cost and is, a ref and is reflective of your time commitment. So I kind of get into that kind of stuff and, and, and so I try to get you to think in those terms while you're considering the Master's in Product Development Program and the Master's in Manufacturing Leadership Program. Okay. Thanks, Liz. Well, I hope you don't mind that we made this a little shorter than an hour. It gives you some time to, to grab a bite or whatever you need to. Thank you to all of our participants on the phone today, and thank you. Oh, is there another no, question? No, no, no. no. And thank you for to our distinguished speaker, Mark, uh, who who joined us today to impart this information. You can advance the slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. If you uh, actually, this is actually should have updated this. So this is the webinar on June 30th, but we have two additional ones coming up on June 11th and June 16th. So look for the email invites. 
June 11th, 11th will be with uh, our career services folks talking to potential new alums or job, job changers. And then on the 16th, we will be covering uh, terrorism in the world today. So look for those emails uh, for these upcoming three webinars.